thank you. So Fallout is uh, this game which takes place in a post-nuclear future. Um, so the story usually goes as follows. You grow up in a bunker, and then when you're all grown up, you go out in the world, in the radioactive world, and you fight monsters and uh, complete missions. But in Fallout 3, um, some very persistent players found that by a certain complex set of actions, you could leave the bunker as a baby. So that meant that uh, you went out in the world as, a, as this tiny person. You could still fight and shoot and everything, but your point of view was really, really low. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you took ages to get anywhere because you weren't going very fast. And uh, well, I, I, think, I think we've all seen them, right? So games are really, really complex systems and uh, they're usually written with really tight deadlines. And so that means that bugs are basically unavoidable. And, uh, and so for instance, falling off the world or uh, having a person stuck in a tree uh, are things that, that, that happen once in a while. So I guess this talk is a bit about how maybe functional programming and functional reactive programming in particular could help um, making games more testable, I guess, or easier to write even. Uh, let's start with uh, the basics. What are we talking about? Reactive programming, um, uh, asynchronous data flow uh, in computer science talk. Um, is uh, basically when you have an environment that uh, gives inputs to the system and the system immediately has to adapt states and uh, give an output uh, to the world. Um, common examples, uh, robotics, uh, sensor, actuator and controller cycles. Uh, you have uh, music, obviously when you press a key you want a sound to come out. Um, a GUI, uh, and uh, spreadsheets are often uh, given as a, as, a, as like a prototypical example, though I thought robots would make for a better picture. Uh, functional reactive programming uh, is reactive programming, but using functional building blocks. Um, so you can do map filter, reduce, and use higher order constructs, basically. Uh, the original paper uh, was by Connell Elliott and Paul Hudak in 1997. Um, and it made quite a stir at the time. Functional reactive animation, I thought, I think it was. Um, for sake of completeness, I'll say that um, uh, there are libraries which are closer to that original paper, which is, uses events and behavior um, to describe a system. Uh, but I went with uh, another library called Elria because, um, well, to be honest, it was, easier to understand for me, and it's been written by uh, this, at the time, PhD student, uh, Gerkali Patai, who then went on to be um, uh, a game programmer, and, uh, and he had quite a, nice, a lot of nice examples um, to clarify what he was doing. So we have two uh, main uh, data types, I guess, uh, parameterized data types. The signal, uh, the signal can be seen as a function between natural numbers, and uh, a data structure. And basically what it is is uh, time varying var var uh, values. Um, so you, your, your stream or your signal is being sampled at times and you get that value back. Then we have signal generators, uh, which are sources of stateful signals. Um, and it can also be seen as a function between natural numbers and I guess values except that uh, what you get, what you can then picture is uh, at every point you have a generator of a signal that starts at that time t. And with those constructs, you can surprisingly do uh, most of what you require in a game. Um, FRP allows you to uh, declare the behavior of your system from the get-go by defining it, de defining it as a network of streams, of interconnected streams. And uh, as you can see, um, you, you, it's, it's really easy to conceptualize. So that's the sales, that's the sales pitch. Um, you, have, you can think of your game as, 
independent streams which are interconnected uh, and, and, and you, d you declare that uh, as your whole system, which is easy to think, think of uh, conceptually, sorry. So when you look at this network, uh, this actually can be uh, directly transcribed to Haskell uh, as follows. Um, we have the random number, player, monster, and game over uh, streams or signals um, being, being described there. And then uh, the end um, is an IO action where uh, you render the frame based on your state. Um, uh, that render frame can be replaced by a more generalized output function like rendering the frame and triggering a sound, for instance, or rendering a frame, triggering a sound, and saving the states or whatever it is. And uh, this network is used um, by, um, by um, running it through, uh, a signal generator is used by running it through the start function. Uh, the start function takes a signal generator and transforms it into, uh, I guess, what is the step operation. Um, and once you do a join of uh, this, this network you've defined, it moves your network one step forward through time as it were. Um, so it's very much a side affecting uh, action. Uh, the loop you have here is the game loop. Uh, it runs uh, 20, uh, 60 times per second uh, in order to display uh, the image you want to see um, in your game. Um, so let's talk about the different components here. We have an external input. So in the read input function here, we're going to feed, um, actually sampling uh, the external input that we have um, by feeding direction keys into a direction sync. And uh, we can use then the direction key signal, which issues from that into our uh, general network. So that's the external input. That external input could also be something coming from the network or mouse or touch or whatever, whatever you need. Then we have uh, self-contained stateful signals, which is basically uh, something you'd picture as uh, the first one would be two, five, eight, et cetera, just a series. Uh, but you can also have um, a random number by just making your random generator go from one number to the next. Then we have stateful signals, which are dependent on other signal. I and I think that's where uh, the main part of the game logic uh, resides. Um, so that takes uh, an initial state, initial player or initial monster. Uh, it takes um, external inputs and other signals uh, as, as, is, as, is, uh, as is suitable. So move player here and wander or hunt are pure functions. Uh, they are really the calculation taking uh, the previous state of the signal and the other signals and uh, calculates the next state of that signal. Um, I think, I think that's, that's a very important point. The main behavior of your system is described by using pure functions. And then we have uh, signals which are, um, I guess, uh, a gathering and processing of other signals. Um, using the apl applicative uh, operators like so. Okay, let's look at this graph again. Uh, you'll notice that um, it's not an acyclic graph, right? You have cycles, you have a uh, player dip, uh, depends on game over, but game over also takes the player signal uh, because obviously game over is going to depend on what's happening in the rest of the game and nothing's going to move once the game is over. So you have, you have dependencies like that. So that's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Because like, it means declaring things in function, in function of other things which have not been declared yet. We use game over in player, while game over is only uh, described at the very end. Um, so uh, this is allowed by the fact that signal generators um, uh, our monad fix instances, and then we also use um, a Haskell um, uh, uh, um, I have a blank, sorry, uh, recursive do uh, extension, which allows you to, to declare that. 
But uh, conceptually, there's another point as well, is that we're not really having a cycle. Um, uh, when player determines means game over, it's a time varying signal. So what we're going to do is have um, player actually depends on a delayed signal. So that means we're going to have player depend on whether game was over in the last round of the loop. Uh, so that means that while it looks like we're using things that are defined at the end, um, and uh, it looks like, sorry, that we have cycles, actually we're, we're not really having cycles, we're having dependencies on uh, delayed uh, signals. Uh, okay, so uh, what else would we need in a game? Uh, apart from monsters and um, players and flesh eating plants and other things. What are the things that are really common uh, in your opinion? Sorry? Guns. <laughs> yeah, we also need guns. But uh, in this case, I was actually thinking about levels and high scores and more, more sort of infrastructure bits. So um, uh, that actually requires some sort of more um, intricate uh, use of those concepts. So we have our signal generators, which um, uh, actually uh, can be represented as a signal starting in time t. And that's also what we're going to use to have dynamically our levels starting uh, later on in the game. So what we're going to do is use the generator function here which takes uh, a signal of signal generators and returns uh, the signal generator we're going to actually um, start at that level uh, at that time. So what we're going to have is play level, um, play level functions for our individual level. So we have one play level with flesh eating plants and one play level with uh, vampire bats and one play level with, uh, with underground um, adventures or whatever. And uh, we can pattern match on the level number to determine which level we're, we're having next. And we're actually going to switch out which generator is being used to generate the current uh, game signal. So that means that um, when uh, our bool signal says, well, this lever is now over, we're going to um, switch to another play level function and uh, on, uh, on the above level, we're going to keep track on which level we are at now and which level we which, which, which should play next. Uh, this is not very clear, so I'm going to add a little drawing. So here in our game, we might have uh, several levels. We have our general system, which has uh, games in it. And then in every game, you have levels. And the level sort of calculates whether the level is over, and then when the level is over, the game sort of starts a new level. And uh, same for the game, uh, the game level, when the game level is over, it says to the upper level, well, uh, the game was over, save my high score, start a new game, and uh, reinitialize the state. And so this way, you can play with several levels of subnetworks, which, which allows you to have what you usually expect in a game. And if this is not super clear, um, don't worry, you have to stare at it quite a while. Then, uh, that's not only it. Uh, like uh, Andrea said, we need guns. Uh, and what does guns mean? It also means uh, keeping track of the state of individual bullets. Um, so in, in a game, you will need to have um, entities which are uh, being created on the fly. So having just a monster and a player is not enough. You will have to have a dynamic sort of number of streams uh, acting at any, any point in time. So one very simple way to handle this would be to have a, a signal of uh, an array of bolts, for instance. So that means that uh, your manage bolt function would then uh, sort of look at that array, potentially add any any new bolts, uh, depending on whether someone is pressing the shoot key and the, the, the position of the player. Uh, or it would, would prune any, any sort of uh, bolts that would have hit anything in the game. Uh, so that would be a possibility. Um, however, um, 
I, th I think there are more elegant ways uh, in the fact that you can uh, define uh, a behavior for every one of those bolts individually and then use uh, generators to create a source of bolts which will create bolts uh, as you need them. Um, and then you, you sort of make a collection of them and, um, and basically add new bolts signals when needed and um, filter out dead ones uh, when they've hit uh, any, any component in the game or when they reach the outer limits of the game. Um, so we're coming to a slightly more hairy part. So far, it was it, so far it was very, I guess, beautiful and simple and everything. Uh, but when you arrive at physics, uh, you're dealing with a different kettle of fish. So I, I think if you have simple physics, you should roll your own uh, because it will sort of fit in that whole framework. However, if you get a lot of moving bodies and uh, different interacting things and floppy things and God knows what else then uh, it makes sense to use an existing physics engine. A physics engine is a bit of a black box. Uh, you define at the start, you define your world, so gravity, you define your bodies that move in it, uh, the mass, the velocity, the acceleration, and stuff like that. And then you sort of push time forward and, uh, and you see what comes out of the box. Um, so this doesn't fit at all in, uh, in our signals, uh, sort of general streaming thing. Fortunately, again, uh, the library uh, I was using had um, a, few, a few functions that could be worked to patch all this in. Uh, one is execute, which uh, basically is lift IO. It uh, allows you to execute an IO action in a signal generator, uh, so in, in your network. And then you have an effectful uh, action which allows you to take that I, uh, an I.O. action and get an actual signal out of it which you can use in other parts of your system. So that means that with execute you initialize your physics engine and with effectful you get out um, the position of your ball that is bouncing around in the system at every iteration of your loop. Okay, uh, let's look at um, rounding up uh, what we looked at. Um, so, what are the cons of using FRP in a game as far as I've, uh, I've experienced? Well, um, I think if your game has a sufficient level of complexity, you will have a lot of streams to manage. More importantly, if you add new entities to your game, that might mean that you will have to affect every other single stream and change those, those, function, those transfer functions for every single stream because it might interact with every single one of them. So that, that can be uh, quite a heavy process, I think, and maybe someone that bears uh, thinking about in a more high level sort of way. Um, then, as I said, with the physics engine, you have uh, some added complexity with handling side effecting that doesn't necessarily fit in, uh, in that streams sort of situation. Uh, so there was a physics engine, but there might also be handling assets in a sort of intelligent way, not having them all loaded in memory uh, when you don't need them anymore, for instance. Um, then there's the question of performance. Uh, I think in the game in industry they use um, languages that allow them to optimize as much as possible to press every single sec second out of things because what is going to cost is the graphical pipeline is going to be the physics engine. You want your game lo logic to be as compressed as possible so that uh, the experience stays really, really uh, fast, I guess. Um, so, so the question is whether uh, Haskell and this in particular with uh, its tree of uh, IO refs in the back end will uh, provide the performance that is needed for, for a game. So that is still, uh, I guess, an open question. So on the positive side, um, it's conceptually simpler. Uh, you only have to think of uh, every entity uh, by itself as a system with other entities coming in to impact on it. On it. Then there's uh, testability. So we had pure functions, that means we can proper do property-based 
uh, testing on those on those entities. So in this in this property, which is not immediately clear, it tests whether um, uh, when the player is in a um, in a position within the world, whether it, you, when you move it, it will still be within the world. So that sort of avoids having any fall of the world uh, bugs in your game. Uh, then there's user testing. So unfortunately, uh, games obviously are all about the user experience. You cannot bypass the user testing because that's the whole point of the game. You cannot have automated testing of games. That is just a fact. Um, but the, the, the plus that you have with uh, functional reactive programming is since the behavior is fixed by your network, the only things you need is uh, capturing the initial state and capturing all the incoming events. And you can uh, very simply replay uh, a situation. So for instance, a bug tester could go record at the point of the game, play the bug and send that to the developer. The developer can then rerun that sequence change the code and rerun that sequence again and see whether uh, the bug is still occurring. So that makes it really, really, I guess, easy easy to do, to test. I think this is also the case with other games, to be fair, but um, it's, it's just conceptually, it, I implemented it in like a couple of hours for my game, so that's, it's really, really easy to do. And it's also, it, I was inspired by Elm, which, uh, which does a similar thing for its debugger. Uh, so, round up. So, uh, the gaming industry um, might be a bit skeptical because this is not a critical system, right? We don't need provable correctness for our system. <coughs> I guess correctness almost comes second to the, the user experience. But if we can prove we can have the same user experience, uh, the same kind of performance, and a better sort of um, conceptual view of what's happening um, in the game and a better way to maintain it, then I think uh, we have a chance to convince them. That's my, that's my talk. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Um, anybody has any questions? And I can run around like an Egypt. Cool. Well, I, w I had one. <laughs> so th there are other functional way of composing a lot of things. Recently, there, there are lenses. How do you see them fit? Like, a, because I, I've heard lens would be very good for saying I have, a, I have a scene with a lot of inside object and I want to uh, change one particular object. So I focus on one object, move this one, and then uh, let's say a process next event. And that would be a different framework, but do you think both things can play together? Um, I guess uh, the question was, um, lenses are also a way to get a particular component out of a, of a data structure uh, or of what's happening. Uh, do you think uh, both FRP and lenses could play together? Uh, it's, it's possible. Um, it, it sort of depends how complex the structures are that are, you're playing with. I guess once you have a state that is a bit, a bit heavy, then definitely using lenses uh, would make sense, I guess. Um, what is your opinion or have you experienced any issues with the garbage collection? Uh, like the, because I've, what I've tried is to uh, use F sharp and Unity with Rx to, uh, to do some functional reactive kind of programming, but then we run into uh, yeah, issues with the amount of garbage being produced, which actually caused lag in the uh, in the game loop, uh, visual lag. Um, and that was due to some technical reasons also, they Im apparently improved the garbage collector, but I wonder how does Haskell perform in this aspect? Uh, have you seen any issues or could you? Okay, um, so let's be completely uh, fair. I've, I don't have an, an enormous game, 
So I don't have lots and lots of components. Um, so it, it's actually not been an issue yet so far. Okay, well, let's uh, discuss afterwards. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I do have a question. Um, so, have you exper experimented a little bit with uh, component game component systems, like uh, as an architecture, uh, you know, kind of a la Unity, but trying to bring that idea of components into FRP, and did, how did that go, yeah, if you tried it? No, I, I've not, but I would be interested to, uh, to have a go if you have references, definitely. Uh, is the code uh, for your game available on GitHub or something? Yes, it is. Oh, cool. Yeah, I can, I can post it. Great. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.